This is uh, tomorrow, Tomorrowland, I think it's called, at Walt Disney World in Florida. It's uh, kind of a Jetsons era hymn to technology, I think. When you visit it, it's kind of easy to feel, you know, that it's a bit of a joke, this kind of retro futurism. It feels very gaudy, it feels kind of kitsch. And certainly, history has shown that its predictions about the future of technology haven't been entirely accurate. But I still love this place. And I think what I love about it the most is the pure excitement it has around the future and technology. Now, it is very easy to be pessimistic, I think, about the future, and frankly, with good reason. But I still really embrace this excitement of technology and what we can build to make that a better place. I don't want to couch that in irony or sophisticated British distance. I genuinely love working with technology, and I think that working on digital products is one of the most exciting uh, and rewarding uh, positions available in this world right now. And right now, it's at a period of enormous flux, and as such, it presents a whole ton of opportunities that never previously existed. So I'm going to talk about some of these changes, some of these opportunities, and what they mean for tomorrow's products. Specifically, I'm going to cover three themes, starting fairly, uh, fairly tangible and becoming abstract as I go. So if I had just one word to describe what I think of as the future of technology, it's this. It's diversity. Diversity in everything. Um, just when we'd started to figure things out, there's an explosion of permutations. I'm not sure we're quite ready for yet. Let's start with the inputs. This is fairly obvious stuff. Uh, it used to be when we were developing a software product that ran on a computer, um, we could be pretty sure the user had a keyboard and mouse to hand. Well, that's no longer the case. Uh, we now know, of course, that we're in very much a touch era. That's happening. That's come to all sorts of mainstream devices. And as, as designers, we're starting to get a bit better about understanding the implications for the experiences they offer. We recognize the touch targets have to be a bit bigger. We recognize that the grip the user has on the device uh, affects the reach they have, and thus where we should be putting buttons and things like that. But I still think some of our understanding of touch is fairly limited. I think we can fleet it far too much with mobile. We always think, well, touch, well, it's a smartphone, it's a tablet, it's a, it's a guy running after a bus, that whole cliche. Um, but it's coming to the desktop. Touch is going to be an issue for any type of digital product, whether it runs on a smartphone or on a PC, um, you know, a 27-inch PC, or even something completely different. Your app already really needs to be touch-friendly, and if you're not focusing on that today, then you probably have maybe about a month left. Um, but touch is easy, I think, compared to some of the emerging input types that are going to be hitting the mainstream fairly soon. Um, one of which is, is free gestures. These literally add a new dimension to input. Um, when people talk about free gestures, they often refer to the minority report UI. It's this horrible cliche. I know it's on someone's bingo card somewhere, so you take that one off. Um, but it's all this whizzy moving hands around and manipulating these windows across a, a snazzy interface. Well, I've got bad news for you. That's not going to happen. Have you actually tried doing that? Have you tried waving your arms around in front of you for an entire day? It sucks. It's really hard work. You actually get... <laughs> Arm fatigue, your upper arm, your lower arm, they'll start stinging after just half an hour or so. Um, the phrase that, the, the, the name given to that condition, for some reason, I should look this up, it's called gorilla arm. I don't know why, um, but that's the, the, the phrase that covers that, that condition. But what we are seeing is free gestural input is starting to come to mainstream devices in more subtle ways. Things like the Xbox Kinect, the Wii, uh, smart TVs, a lot of them have embedded cameras. You can do rudimentary gestures and so on to manipulate that interface. Voice is obviously another breakthrough input method, which is coming very much to the fore. Siri, I think, was its first widely understood packaging uh, in, in terms of product. But obviously, we've had voice control in things like dictation apps going back for you know, a decade or so now, probably, probably longer. Voice as an input asks us even more questions that are very new to our industry. What are the privacy implications of speaking your commands out loud? What is the syntax? What grammar do you actually train your interface, your system, to understand? How do people interact with it? Do you want the users to uh, trigger this thing by actually greeting it and telling it to start listening? Or is it listening all around? There's a lot more complexity. Again, a lot more potential privacy implications, things like that. How do you deal with accents? How do you deal with dialects? How do you get people to uh, be understood by this system? 
some pretty complex stuff. We're also seeing diversity in inputs through sensors. And there's been a lot of talk about that kind of thing uh, today already. Sensors embedded in smartphones or elsewhere in the environment that are simply beaming off data that we're learning to, har to har harness and to turn into meaningful uh, product decisions. The um, iPhone, uh, the new iPhone, as you're aware, comes with a motion processor, dedicated motion processor, to allow for more of that kind of capability. This is the Jawbone Up. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It's a sensory bracelet that, in essence, allows you to quantify uh, your activity through the day, as we see in, this, in, in the application. So we're seeing a ton more of these crossover products. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the hybridization of the digital product and the real, the physical product a little bit later on. So the inputs are getting pretty complex, uh, but that's nothing because we also have diversity in the outputs as well. The smartphone has taught us to consider the narrow user interface. Previously, again, there was relative homogeneity, maybe 14 to 18 inches for a monitor. Well, now we have to deal with three. We have to figure out how our products work in this environment. And hence, we've had a lot of discussion of later on things like responsive design around reflowing content and prioritizing different features for smartphones and so on. But I'm probably more interested in the other end. We haven't really explored the large screen experience, what's sometimes known as the 10-foot UI. And this introduces some very sophisticated challenges. Um, for, for a start, your input method is going to be different. You're not going to use one of these with a keyboard and a, and a mouse. Instead, you're going to use a set-top box or a games console that has a browser on it or whatever it is. You're going to be using either a nasty little D-pad controller or you might be using some kind of uh, gestural interface or a wand or something like that. But there's also the distance, which has impact on legibility and, again, privacy. People can clearly see what you're doing. Um, how do we safeguard the user's data and so on in those scenarios? There's also diversity within the screens themselves. The density, the readability that's caused by this, this the number of pixels per inch, basically, within these screens, even on the same platform. Specifically, uh, we see it probably more on Android, where we have a ton of different DPIs to handle. But this causes quite a significant change in the way people interact with that technology, whether, they're like, uh, whether they are likely to read on the device, whether they're likely to uh, you know, do artistic tasks, and so on. A lot of that can actually depend on the quality of the screen. But even then, we're having outputs that are beyond the visual. Um, the advent of sound as an output, as an output I think, is, is particularly interesting. Again, Siri is a, a packaging of that, but we've had sound uh, as an output to us in sat-navs uh, for, you know, for a long time. This uh, is a particularly interesting example. Uh, it's not a massively useful project, uh, product yet. This is a product by the name of Ollie, and this is a little, little smelly robot, and you can connect it to Twitter or Facebook, and every time you get a mention or a notification, it will release a scent. Um, and I think, you, I think you buy these little files of scent, and you pour them into certain containers, and I guess it's a heat heat thing right, and out it goes. This may not be the future <laughs> of product design, um, but I think it's really interesting to look, again, at that explosion of, of diversity in the outputs that are available to us. And with this comes contextual diversity. I think a lot of software up until recently, we've had some fairly stale assumptions about, particularly that it's going to be used by a white dude at a desk. And we are moving past that, which is, which is Fantastic. No longer do we consider that technology is a different world. We used to say that you, know, you visited cyberspace through a portal. It was a separate dimension. And then when you were done, you packaged it up, you logged off, and you re-entered your own world. It's not the way it's happened. Technology has colonized our world. It's coming with us in our daily lives. And that means there's a huge number of different uh, potential contexts for the things we make. Diversity of environments, of cultures, of languages, of activities, of locations, of social norms, of bandwidths, and so on. Now, there's a whole other talk uh, that I have around context, which obviously I haven't got time to cover. I have written up a fairly extensive thing. I'll tweet that link a little bit later on, so that might be of interest. And then platforms also offer significant diversity. Again, this was a simple challenge. It was Windows. Um, or you know, maybe Mac, if you were after a certain market or capability or whatever it would be. 
Mobile has introduced some new platforms with which we're all familiar. Those are stabilizing. Really, there's Android and iOS, and maybe Windows Phone stabilizing is your major ones. But even then, there are new ones that we may not have considered. We have Facebook that has 1 million monthly, uh, 1 billion, uh, monthly active users and a very busy app ecosystem. We have the web browser, particularly something like Google Chrome, which is becoming almost as much of a, uh, an app platform as well as a web browser to access HTML on servers. Those lines between native and web, particularly, are getting very blurred. We're also seeing services that stretch across numerous platforms. This, to an extent, is just paving the cow paths of what users want. It's a fairly natural expectation to say, well, I want to start a task on one device, and then in a different context, take it with me to a PC or something like that. Um, these are some stats from, from Google. 90% of consumers use multiple screens in sequence when they're looking at you know, a, a, larger, a larger task. Designers, therefore, have to start thinking about the holistic experience and even carry that through to non-digital touch points beyond the realm of the product or the app itself. All the systems that underpin those interactions. So this could be, is your Marcoms, is that aligned with the communication that you're putting out within your product? What's your customer service like? Is that seamless? Is it joined up? How about labeling, tone of voice, packaging, all of these things, are they aligned? So in essence, these are, these are designers who are looking at designing entire services. And this is another instance, I think, where we're seeing blurring of the traditional boundaries that underpinning mo many products, perhaps most, underpinning products is still some layer of service structure, a service underpinning that keeps that product uh, sustainable. So a really thorny challenge in product design at the moment is to consider what I call the horizontal or the vertical integration of these systems. So how do you balance cross-platform consistency with the expectation of that specific platform? So here's an example uh, from Twitter. We have a, a number of platforms we run on Twitter.com, iPhone, iPad, Android, uh, mobile, M2, which is our, our lo-fi uh, M. site, and TweetDeck. And on the right, on the, on the horizontal axis here, I put a number of features just for the sake of argument that we have on Twitter. Now, there are, there are a couple of ways that you can approach this. And generally, two different camps emerge when you talk about this kind of stuff. The first is what I'll call the horizontal people. These generally want a consistent experience across different platforms. So here we want the sign-up experience to be relatively uh, coherent between all of those. Generally, these people uh, will argue that we get better reach this way, generally lower maintenance. And also, if you're a user who's straddling all these platforms, you're going to have a better experience because it's joined up, because it's memorable uh, from the previous platform. I'm generalizing here, but I normally find engineering teams skew this way. Um, now, whether that's to do because you know, sometimes they believe in the universality, universality of technology, or whether it's simply just they want to reduce the amount of rework they're going to have to do and reduce the maintenance, but it's a pattern I see fairly frequently. The vertically integrated people tend to argue that it's better to create the optimal experience for fewer people. Um, in that case, you can dominate the specific vertical you're after or the specific instance or the use case that you're targeting. So I think this really suits the higher end experiences where it's all about delight and polish, these kind of things. You can really tailor that experience to that user on that platform. And again, I think I'm generalizing here, but designers tend to skew this way because those words I just said, delight and experience and polish, they tend to be ones that, that really sort of you know, light up their neurons. Now, there is no way to know the right answer, of course, to this, this, this challenge, other than to know your audience, to experiment, to understand your context and your business goals around this sort of thing. A lot of it's trial and error, and there's huge tension in either direction. And as such, I think it's a terribly important focal point for modern product design. So moving on from diversity, the second major theme I want to talk about is materials. Information has historically, uh, at least in connected online products, information has been the material that we've been manipulating. And there have been communities of practice set up to help us get better at that, not least the information architecture movement, which was born, uh, to a large extent, born of library and information science. And um, you know, this has been a very successful movement, and I think a lot of the website industry still focuses very strongly on this. 
They're talking uh, about content and the layout and the structure of that content, the metadata, how people navigate through that information space. But as product designers, I think we have a different set, or a, an additional set, shall I say, of materials to deal with. One of those is time. One of the things that's most, uh, knowledge, or most recognizable when you move into products is the time axis, the user stepping through a product, seeing sequential screens and responding to them. And a well-designed product has a flow to it, it has a rhythm, a cadence. Now, this time axis is very difficult to learn, I think, but it is important to get right. You know, how does your system respond? Does it give good feedback? Uh, does it load quickly? Does it have good performance? A lot of the stuff on the time axis helps really to, to create that feel in that, that rather ugly phrase, look and feel. A lot of the feel part, I think, is in getting time right. And with time, therefore, that, that, that brings motion. And motion's a really important phase, I think, of digital product design at the moment, particularly within larger teams. I think partly this is because of the touch era. And the touch era, we're used to the idea of direct content manipulation. I touch something and I'll move it. I'll drag it across the screen. Therefore, motion becomes just a little more inherent uh, within that system. It leads to what's been called kinetic UIs, where elements respond to interaction. And that, in doing so, they communicate what they do. So good, a good transition can speak a thousand drop shadows. I know that this fits in like this. I know this goes here and this affects this. It's not a replacement for visual cues or for text, but it's definitely a great supplement. And a lot of senior design teams, I think, are really exploring the limits of motion design at the moment. I actually stumbled across a really nice article this morning um, around transitions in UX design. Again, I'll tweet that link if you'd like to learn more about that. But I do think there's, um, you know, sometimes when you get a, a, a good designer will come along and uh, look at an interface and instantly say, oh, that's two pixels off, right? It's, it's you know, it's misaligned. And if you're less into design, you might go, what, really, is it? And you get really close. And you, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. Well, I think designers are going to have to start doing the same with motion as well. I think the really skilled ones in a couple of years will be the ones who can come along and say, no, it's 50, 50 milliseconds out. You know, we've got to, we've got to just snap that onto, onto a better time axis. There's a new skill starting to emerge. Just one really quick tip around motion. I shared this on Twitter the other day as a confession, really. And um, people seem to... to uh, to like it. Um, if you find an old transition, uh, if you're releasing a new version, just shave it down, just tighten up just that little bit. And the result is when you launch the new version, then people say, oh, wow, this version feels faster. You know, well, <laughs> <laughs> and I do this. Um, <laughs> and it does work, I can promise you. Uh, clearly, it's not going to last forever. You know, you're going to get faster than light transitions that happen before you open the product. Um, but it is worth thinking, you know, keep your transitions tighter than you might think at first blush, particularly if you're going to be, uh, users are going to be interacting with them frequently, opening them and closing them very quickly. So if motion design is one of the big trends of this year, I, my hunch is that sound design is going to become one of the big trends of maybe the next year or two. Um, our products are largely mute. I think that's flavored rather by the early excesses of the web. Remember those auto-playing MIDI files? Um, someone asked, I meant, again, I mentioned this on Twitter, and someone said, are they going to come back then? Like, yeah, I hope so. They were fantastic. <laughs> <clears throat> but I do think it's time for a, a, a renaissance around sound design. And industrial designers know the importance of sound very well. You all know the, the, the tales of how um, automotive design teams spend months and months getting the slam of the car door just right. Because sound evokes quality. It evokes the personality of the product in really interesting ways. And there are other in industries that are way ahead of us, um, as well as physical product design. There are video game designers, um, entertainment, and the slot machine industry. They have their stuff nailed. I mean, it's, it's you know, borderline unethical what they do with sound design. It's clearly designed to get people to pump more money. But it communicates the state of the system, um, and it engages the user in really interesting ways. And then there are atoms, these things that I think we thought we were going to avoid as digital designers. As we're finding our products going into uh, new places, new devices, with battery life, and with all sorts of tricky things around atoms, um, 
we're having to give consideration to them in a way that we, we, we thought we'd avoid. You know, proper industrial design issues like battery life and portability and servicing. What happens when a component goes wrong? Um, shipping, packaging, and so on. Anyone who's operating in that space will quickly find they get dragged down with a lot of the things that, that uh, they otherwise thought they may not have to get involved with. So how does this technical diversity of inputs and outputs and so on, and the new materials that product designers have to deal with, how do they change designers themselves? And how do they affect the processes by which they, they work? Well, I think it's natural that with these new demands, we start to do things differently. When we talk about process, there's a single design approach that has been fairly dominant, I would say, in the last decade, 15 years, something like that which is user-centered design, or UCD. And you usually see it separated into roughly four phases. There are, there are thousands of different UCD diagrams out there, but more or less, it comes down to research, followed by design, then validation of said design, and iteration, looping back. Um, prototyping could be you know, within the design phase there, for instance. And this approach has been prevalent for many years, um, with very good reason. The, era that preceded it, particularly in digital design, was a bit of a wild west, to be honest. There wasn't too much structure around design. There maybe wasn't too much user centricity in terms of thought. So that helped establish some rigor um, and some structure to how to really understand the needs of your users and to bake those into your product such that it, it solves their needs. But there are other design methods out there. Just a couple here. Um, genius design was a fairly unpleasant label um, but really, this says there's no research phase. You're going off the design team's uh, expertise and the product team's expertise um, to make decisions on what's right for the user in this, uh, in this scenario. There's data-driven design, where we might be doing small, very small A-B tests or limited launches, weird kind of experiments, and then you get feedback on living products, which is obviously a very advantageous thing. There's uh, self-design, where, in essence, you become a proxy for the user if you really understand that, you can scratch your own itch, and then it's actually a bit of a waste of time talking to other people because you can do it yourself. Or well, there's participatory design, where you actually make the customer part of the process. You drag them into the meeting rooms. You give them a, a pen and say, right, start drawing our interface, start sketching this thing out. So there are all sorts of different processes coming to the fore. And I'm not saying that user-centered design is wrong, um, but I am saying that other approaches are starting to become suited to different types of project as that diversity and as those materials start changing beneath our feet. So I think select, uh, successful designers uh, these days are, are the ones who can have a toolkit of approaches and to vary their process according to the needs of that particular project and that particular client. And of course, this then has an impact on the tools that designer, uh, designers use. Now, there's a fair bit of ideology and, and sloganeering that goes on when we start talking about design tools. And if you listen to anyone uh, about tooling at the moment, they'll all say, well, we're in a post-Photoshop era. It's dead. This idea of the static mock-up or comp or whatever you call it, that's dead. Well, that's, that's nonsense. High-fidelity tools are still very important, I think, for designers. Sometimes you need to have that uh, level of detail. And also for a skilled designer, a skilled user of Photoshop, Photoshop is a sketching tool just as much as it is a deliverable tool. So if I want to try something out, I might sketch it out on paper, but then I can jump into Photoshop and say, okay, well, does this work? And actually, no, it has no balance. It doesn't communicate the flow. So I'll move it. I'll change this. I'll put it on the left. I can do that very quickly in something like Photoshop. But there are new tools starting to come to the fore, and they, they are mixing some of Photoshop's pixel-level detail with some of the more fluid needs of rapid, rapid prototyping. Everyone's building a Photoshop killer at the moment, um, one that's has interactivity baked in and lightweight prototyping and so on. Now, all of these things are a little bit flawed at the moment, um, but that won't last. There's certain, those competitors and that diversity in tooling will definitely start to become a more significant issue for designers uh, in the coming years. And then there are tools um, almost completely from left field that product designers have never really focused on, um, but are starting to become relevant, particularly around motion design. What you're seeing here is a demo of um, Quartz Composer, this is done by uh, Dave O'Brien, who's uh, one of my colleagues in the design team at Twitter. And 
he's mocking up uh, the Facebook home interface. Uh, Quartz Composer got a ton of uh, attention from the design community um, when I think it was Julie Xu from Facebook posted um, a breakdown of how they'd come to the Facebook home design, mentioned Quartz Composer. Of course, the industry goes mental for this thing and says, okay, we, we must learn it. Um, as you can see, it's not wildly intuitive. Uh, it's a very different model than something like Photoshop. But tools like Quartz Composer or even After Effects, even Keynote, um, people are using those to build living, breathing interfaces that give you a better idea of the feel of the product, something that Photoshop definitely can't do. And most designers with those skills are in a ton of demand right now. It makes sense then that all this change is causing skill fluidity as well. And uh, also, I, uh, and I, Identity fluidity as well, I think, for, uh, for designers. About 10 years ago, maybe 15, a um, very successful group of people, if you like, broke away from the digital design pack. And they call themselves user experience designers or IAs or interaction designers and so on. And it's been a fantastically successful movement and one I was very much um, part of um, in my small way. Um, but I think the pendulum is now returning. And I think centralization is one of the trends that I see most strongly within the design community. And this is almost um, a result of the success of the interaction designers. Their skills have become so core to product design that actually separating those roles, I think, is starting to make a lot less sense. I look at separation of visual and interaction design now. It's a bit like saying, well, you know, I'll take the wheel and you do the pedals. One person can do both of those uh, things quite well. As I think the best designers now, are the ones who can take a design all the way from strategic phase, through idea generation, through prototyping, through visual design, through testing, and then iterating on that, and then realizing the final product. And that means there are fewer slips, there are fewer miscommunications, uh, and you have people who can really be a custodian of a product and help nurture it all the way through to, to its realization. So this means that the identity of designers is becoming fluid as well. Designers are certainly becoming broader in their scope. Some of them are moving into product. Um, not a massively easy transition sometimes, I think. Um, some of them also straddle engineering. And there's a new uh, genre, if you like, of designer, sort of designer slash developer hybrid. I think particularly in the younger generation, I see this coming through, this digital maker who will actually do all of those things and be able to create these prototypes and these models very quickly on the fly and realize them in a final product. And that's a tough fit, I think, in a lot of larger companies that have static structures or static team makeups. But I think particularly for smaller product teams, someone like that can be extremely valuable in helping to realize your ideas sooner. So I've painted a fairly broad and a fairly demanding picture, I think, of the, uh, of the modern product designer. But the people are out there. I meet a ton of designers um, in the London community, in the UK community, and, and globally uh, through you know, mentoring and events and so on. Particularly within London, I think there's quite an agency mentality. There's quite a client services history, maybe linked to advertising. Um, and I speak to a lot of people who are working as user experience designers, visual designers, and so on in these companies. And they all tell me, they all tell me in confidence, <laughs> um, that what they really want to do is, is work on products. There's a definite swing I'm seeing um, toward people wanting to move away from client services and move in-house and work with a product team over a long period, nurturing an application, some kind of product. So I think the brightest and boldest are out there. Um, they want to join you, just need to identify them. And particularly, one thing I think is critical, one piece of advice I, I could offer if you're talking with designers, is to sell them on the vision and the scope of what you're doing. Talk to them about the future of technology and how you see your product being part of that. And I think they'll be fairly quickly won over. Thanks for your time. <laughs>